Hey everyone, welcome to the Couch GM podcast. You can find the full video version of this podcast on YouTube, or you can listen to the audio version on whichever major podcast platform you prefer. Make sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel, and you can also find me on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, and Facebook. Just search the Couch GM and you'll see my logo pop up. And with that, let's get into the podcast. All right, we're here today at New Athlete. This is uh, Ryan Paul, who's the owner. And uh, so thank you for sitting down with me and doing this podcast first yeah, off. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Yeah. So a little background on how I got connected to Ryan. Um, so back in high school, I graduated in 2012. Um, I grew up in Vancouver and I played sports, football, baseball, uh, swimming. And there was a few athletes that were, um, you know, a few levels ahead of me, you could say. And I always heard of new athlete mm -hmm. back in high school. Wasn't quite sure what it was. Um, I heard of electroshock stuff going on and some various other um, training and so yeah wanted to connect with you and learn more about your story how you yeah. started new athlete what you do yep so where yeah. do you want me to start start from the beginning if you want okay um how far back let's get into the roots okay uh who are up, you where did you come from how did you get into what you're doing today okay grew up in new york uh played football um i went out for baseball for one day um, way I didn't I didn't appreciate the sport at that time, and looking back now, um, now that I've had a lot of baseball guys that I've worked with, I wish I would have stuck with it. Not just because I'm not going to imply that I could have been something, but just to appreciate the different side of the sport and, and more specifically what it does to your brain. Because playing football, it's just it's go 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 go. If you want, you can smash someone as hard as you want or you can find contact if that's what you really want where baseball is more I don't want to say it's a thinking game but it kind of is um, but there's a lot of downtime and you know training these guys watching games I've seen games where outfielders don't get anything right. nothing hit to them and they're outstanding in a field for three hours and that's unbelievably boring right but I mean, that's part of it. And that's, there is, I think there's beauty in it, but I didn't appreciate it. You back have to then. always be ready. Yeah. So anyways, um, got recruited by 20 or so schools for football and had a couple, probably three D1 offers for walk-ons. It didn't really matter because when it came to me actually leaving or the thought of leaving home, I didn't have the skill set to actually do it. So fear took over and I balked at all of it. So I went to a JUCO, um, actually got recruited to play basketball there. And even the thought of doing that was just, it was too much. So I was paralyzed by fear. Um, so I played a couple of years of semi-pro football, which is nothing special. Um, is that Canadian? No, 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 that was, that was stateside. There's a, there's okay. a ton of semi-pro football leagues and teams that are in the States. Um, if you've ever gone to a game, it's, you would think it's almost like an, uh, an add-on to a fair or <laughs> like a carnival. It doesn't mean there's not guys that can't play because they yeah. can, but I mean, it's, it's pretty janky. Gotcha. Um, but I was under this delusion that if I just trained that much harder, someone would come and find me and went to an arena tryout, made it past the first cuts, and that was pretty much it. So in doing that, I also wanted to stay involved with sports. So Don Beebe at the time had just retired from playing with the Packers. He played for four or five years with the Bills. And I saw that he was going across the country doing speed camps. So I worked a way to get him to actually come to my high school. And in watching what he was doing just over a weekend camp, it was fun. Couldn't believe the kind of money he was making just for a weekend. But then to actually see the change in athletes while he was doing that, that's that's kind of where the hook was um and then to bring a buffalo bill player to the podink school that i grew up in you know, that's that's kind of like how in the world did you pull that off yeah i still don't remember how we did it but we did it so at the same time i'm doing that messing around with semi joe football um kind of dragging my wife through hell thinking that i'm going to play this thing when she just needs me to be a good husband and a good dad right and you know, I don't care about playing. I'm great that you, it's great that you can play, but you know, I need you to have a solid job. Don't come home talking about the game and stuff like that. It just, yeah. 
wrong place, wrong time. Um, and my priorities weren't straight. So she got to a spot where she's like, screw it, we're going to move. And Vancouver, Washington is where it was. How did that end up? Uh, well, here, I mean, everything's great now. But I right. mean, it was honestly my plan at the time, as cowardly as this sounds, was to leave two daughters at the time and my wife and go back to New York and do who knows what. But it, it was basically the, the idea that you have a job to do as a husband, you have a job to do as a parent, and I'm going to try to make this childhood dream work right? because I was insecure with myself, and that's, that's essentially why I, I continue to try to push that. But moved out here, um, started training out of my truck, and I bought one, one or two pieces of equipment. I would pack it up, drive from field to field. And basically she said, you've got two weeks to make this work or you're gonna get a real job. And what year was this? Uh, shoot, well, I actually started at 24 Hour Fitness in 2001. Technically started New Athlete in 2001. As you were mentioning, uh, it was about 2001 when you first got to 24 Hour Fitness and then? Yep, um, I was horrible there. Uh, I would not adhere to the practices that they wanted uh, me to do, which was basically to go find people uh, that were overweight, tell them they're overweight, and then convince them that I'm the one that's going to get them out of that situation. And it's like, to me, it's like you really think that they don't know they're overweight when they see themselves every day, and then I'm going to be the pompous right. ass to tell them that they're something that they already know they are. Um, so I didn't, I didn't do good at that, um, and I didn't like the idea that that was the practice that you were going to go about. So uh, that's where I left there and then started doing stuff out of my truck. Cool. So you started doing stuff out of, out of your truck. Um, what was your goal or what, what did you see that turning into? Was there a certain type of athlete or? No, it was survival. Okay. Um, I didn't have, I didn't necessarily have a vision. Uh, I didn't know how the winters were here. Growing up in New York, you know, we were out every weekend. We were doing pickup basketball, pickup football. Um, it was rare to not be doing something physical. You know, if if the weather was nice and we weren't playing football, we were riding half pipe. Um, some of you, some of the older guys, will know what that means. <laughs> but um, no, it's it's just it's a different mentality, and I think it's a different generation with kids out here. Yes, there's going to be active kids, but. They don't do what they did back then. At least that's what my take is. I'm sure that'll that'll piss some people off. But um, so you talk about being active, that type of thing. Just active, like I mean, I guess my question for you is: Were you guys doing pickup whatever every weekend or nearly every weekend that you were growing up? Well, yeah, and it's with technology. I think is a big part of it because you know myself and my brothers, we'd be out in the yard every day when we're not doing yard work. Yep. Um, you know, and that's the thing is like my dad growing up, it was either, it was either get a job or play a sport during that yep. time. And so we were all always doing, you know, summer sports, summer baseball, football, you name it. Um, yeah. Playing out in the yard, always being active, doing something. Um, yeah. And I can see what you're, what you probably mean by, and yeah, the technology nowadays, people are more sedent mm -hmm. or sedentary and yeah, that's definitely a problem. I think the other thing is with my, I don't want to say generation, but you didn't have travel basketball. That was, I mean, it was there, but not in the area we were in. You, you would have had to have driven or you would drive to wherever you were going to play or practice. Uh, club baseball was not what you see today. Club volleyball didn't even exist. And in fact, I think up until five years ago, it still did not exist in that area. Um, if you got up near Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, I'm sure there were clubs, but I mean, it, it wasn't even thought of. Uh, club lacrosse was something, but you know, I didn't do that just because I didn't know the sport. Yeah. Um, so anyways, coming out here, survival mode, it was basically, I'm gonna take one client, figure out a way to turn it into three. And what was crazy is I went from one to three to 33 clients in two weeks. Wow. And then to 88 in two months. Man. And then come to find out, okay, apparently... How do I manage this also? Well, the, the managing wasn't really that difficult at the time just because you could kind of dictate when your sessions were. And that was based on 
Okay, you you look at the summers out here; they're they're actually pretty yeah. docile compared to New York. Um, so you have a lot of freedom to go and do whatever you're doing. The problem was is that I'm a new guy on the block. There were people that were training that were kind of established with different athletic directors, different schools, mm -hmm. and I had no idea that that was a thing. Um, so it wasn't long before I got booted off of each school and then each school that was in a certain district. So that kind of went away. So you could meet in parks, but then that kind of took the way the, you know, hey, we're going to meet on a track. The track is nice. Yeah. In a sense, your facilities turned into really we're going to go to a park where there's potholes and, right. you know, the, the risk of injuries go up. So from there, uh, enter into the fall of that first year that I was actually doing it that was turned into racquetball space at a local club. And at least it gave me a roof over my head. So we bounce up to 88 members, clients, whatever you want to call it. And from there, um, the club saw that I was paying a minimal amount of rent. So then they wanted all the members that were coming to me to become members of the club. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Because they were after money. Right. And then on top of that, they're like, well, we're going to triple your rent because you're using so much of our space. If you looked at the club now, no one uses it and they hadn't used it then. And yeah. it, it honestly, if you had someone that could dump money into it, it would be hands down, probably one of the best facilities on the West Coast. So anyways, started in the uh, renting racquetball space. I guess that would technically be my first legit facility. And then the club manager came in and said, well, you got to pay more. So doing the math on what they were actually wanting to charge me, in addition to forcing all those kids to become members of that club, that's where I'm like, it doesn't make sense to do this. So then I bit the bullet and opened my first facility. And that was about 5,000 square feet. And that's kind of took off from there. Where was that located? Uh, up off of 78th Street in Hazeldale. Okay. Yeah. Um, awesome. So you started your own spot. You just kind of took the, took the leap. I and, did, yeah. And uh, so you had 88 clients at that time mm -hmm. that you basically, were, were they all high school? Were there, were there some college, some other Maj athletes? Um, I mean, at that time, majority was just all high school. Okay. And it wasn't a certain sport focused? It was kind of just athletes? It was just athletes. Okay. I mean, I would say the majority has, was football and probably has always been football. Okay. So you moved, moved to your new spot. What's the next step from there? What does that turn into? So five years there, then... Um, kind of going into a downsizing side of things just because I was focused more on the ARP or the electric modality that we were, that you referred to earlier. Okay. Um, just because that was, it was a lot easier to keep my margins up. I could fly through people, um, get a great result. And the thing that's funny is a lot of people think it's a glorified stim unit, but it is not, it's completely different. Essentially what the ARP does is it identifies the electrical disconnect between the brain's signals to the muscle and the muscle itself. So in the technical term, we're identifying the sodium potassium leakage in the cell where normal stim, you just plop it on kind of distal proximal to where the injury is or the site of pain is, and you just sit. The ARP allows us to break down those compensating movement patterns, which then puts you in an environment to heal you. So the ARP in and of itself is not healing the problem, it's removing what is preventing you from healing you. So is that specifically for injury type stuff? It or predominantly is, is injury, but okay. we'll also use it to recover from training sessions. Okay. You know, if individuals have a chronic tight back, first we wanna identify why, if we can through video, why that's happening. Once we identify that, then we would use ARP. If we're not able to correct that, then we would use the ARP to figure out what muscles are not working the way they're supposed to address that. And another way to look at it also is that it, it kind of coincides with the body's meridians. So if you've ever done acupuncture, meridians are channels of energy in the body, and there is an electrical signal that flows through that, this can identify where that is clogged in a sense or mm -hmm. shut off. Bring that back online, which again is gonna put you in a position to heal you. So uh, do you have like a, a background with anything, you know, physical therapy or medical? Because that's like a very detailed thing. Or is it just kind of you started at one spot and then you just added on 
as you went with so as far as the background on those things no um i've i've kind of built it up through self-learning and clinics that i've gone to uh courses and, and certifications that i've gone to but to be frank i never should have had the arp um <laughs> but because of how arp was running things back in the day they just wanted machines out and if you checked a box and you were willing to pay what they were charging you would get one gotcha um so that brought on <laughs> in 2011 that brought on an investigation from the department of health because of me practicing medicine unbeknownst to me and i know that some people are going to be like this guy's a complete idiot he didn't think to look at the laws or the scope of practice but i didn't because when i would have a question i would defer to arp they would just say well you're under our umbrella you're fine and then i would just ignorantly go about my business doing what i was doing and i know that there were a lot of pts in the area that were just i mean they were furious that some clown in a garage is treating people with a device that is a medical device who I should not have it, but I did. Um, So that was also kind of a a reason why I switched from doing training to more of the ARB side of things back to training. Okay. Just because I didn't know that there was a scope that I needed to adhere to. I didn't know that you needed to be a licensed medical practitioner. Again, it, it sounds completely ignorant, but I was focused on the result. I was focused on helping the athletes because I felt like there was a deficient C or deficiency in traditional PT that was not addressing some of these athletes' issues. They would come to me, we would fix them, and they were like, oh my gosh, we've done tons of and there PT. There was a benefit there, so it's not like, so you're not you know, raising your own questions. It's like, hey, this is working right help more people with it right and and i've always looked at things as you know the if the client has a need and you can meet that need then what's the issue but it's not that easy so uh 2011 hits um we got to change a bunch of things focus more on training once i studied the law on what needed to be done there was some points where I'm like, okay, well, maybe I go back to school and become a PT. And it's like, I was a horrible student to begin with. That's not an option. Um, and then factor in, I had four kids then. Definitely wasn't going to happen. The cost of doing uh, that. Yeah, the cost and then just the, you know, what am I going to do? Time, do yeah. I really want to be a PT? Do I want to drop training and then focus on being a PT? That just, it just wasn't, it wasn't a viable option. Um, so then you fast forward where it's like, okay, well, what are the options? Well, hire a PT. So we did that. And then we've had multiple PTs that have been in house. Okay. So we do, and we're good. <laughs> we're, we've checked all the boxes. We're legal. Good. <laughs> so, um, but that was a hard lesson that I, I put myself in where I should have at the time studied it more. I just didn't have it in the mindset of, okay, what possibilities are out there that I'm violating? I just, you know, it was like, well, I guess we'll deal with it later. These people are at my door. It's business. They need to get fixed and I could fix them. Right. So I did. So you transitioned back to training or your focus back to training. I mean, it's both now where, you know, it's training and we do ARP and then we have PT Okay, and we'll get into, we can go through your, you know, player evaluation, like all sure. that stuff. Um, so 2012, um, you know, where are things at? And then where do they progress from there? So let's see, 2012, um, we downsized, moved locations over to Highway 99, um, got through the audit, um, you know, made the changes that needed to be made based on credentialing, um, moved back over to 78th Street, link up with Dr. Forgy, and then I hired a PT, brought not only PT back on, but then brought full-blown ARP to where we were servicing people on a regular basis with that. Um, we're there for about five years, then moved to where our current location is right now. Awesome. And so... Um 
Yeah, this has just kind of been an, an evolution from where you yeah. first started. And did you start with this entire facility, or did you build out eventually and add space? The one that we're currently yeah, in? Yeah, this one. No, we started with the entire space. Okay. And so I, I noticed you, know, you have some baseball stuff over there, like yep. a batting cage. Um, yeah, I guess kind of talk us through your current, you know, what services do you provide to someone that comes in mm -hmm. that wants to get better? So services are, I mean, it ranges anywhere from normal training, traditional if someone just wants quality of life, to human performance. Um, we are a speed specialist facility with universal speed rating uh, that was started by Les Spellman. And we also got into the GOTA side of things, which was more on analyzing movement patterns through video. Um, we do have the ARP, so I guess ARP specialty as far as injury recovery. Um, we have a PT, Dr. Daniel Abdi. Um, he's been with us for a little under a year. And yeah, I mean, it's any, anything that you could have want human performance wise, we do. Awesome. And so, yeah, what does that player evaluation look like when someone comes in to your facility? Sure. Where, where so do you start? basically what we want to do is get them on video from a frontal plane, lateral plane. We could do some sagittal, multi-directional, but it's the flaws that the athletes have are going to be expressed right away with basically the frontal plane. Um, so in the industry, the majority of how athletes are videoed are basically from the side. And I get that. And there's a piece that you need on that, especially when it comes to running and speed. But I think what gets missed is a lot of the frontal plane where if an athlete is loading on the inside edge of their foot, chances are the ankle is going to collapse inward and the knee is going to follow that. So in the, the technical term, the knee would drop into valgus or towards their midline. And that in and of itself doesn't necessarily give you pain, but it can be a result of a previous injury or eventually will lead to pain or a degradation in performance. Mm -hmm. So we want to look at a global perspective of, or a global view of how the athlete is moving. Yeah, and it only makes sense to look at them from every angle. It's not just the side sure. you want to look at. As far as the evaluation process is concerned, when you start to bring to light some of the issues that athletes kind of have known they've had, but they couldn't put their finger on it, it's almost like this, finally, someone is giving me something more than just, well, your quad is weak or your glutes are weak. We're actually seeing it on film and we've all heard the eye in the sky doesn't lie. You can't hide it on film. So once we see that, then we know exactly what I guess, prescription the athlete needs to yeah. address those issues. And then also the prescription, um, it's, it's dependent on the, the player's position and, you know, what sport they play and all these different factors. Yeah, to some degree. And I, I don't want to get into the skill side of things because that then you kind of you kind of branch off into a neighborhood that that I don't want to mess with. So if I've got a baseball player that comes in and he's got an injury, Yes, I want to know more about what he's doing, but well, let me back up. Baseball guys don't train with me anymore. Okay. Traditionally, they're training with new athlete baseball. Okay. Um, but so that's I, a separate thing. That's a separate thing. Okay. Um, if I do have a baseball player that comes in and I'm dealing with the injury side of things, yes, the skill side of what he's doing. If he is he infield, outfield, you know, pitcher. is he pitcher, catcher, whatever? Yep. Those things are important to me. I need to know that. But I'm not going to go, hey, to change your skill, you know, maybe you do this because that's not my wheelhouse. Right. And I don't want to start going into, you know, cutting in on the, the skill coach that they have. For that. Yeah. Exactly. Um, same with a football guy. If, if I've got a receiver that comes in and I know he's working with a receiver coach, I'll offer some things that I see. You know, maybe you should load your foot this way rather than how right. you have presented to me. But don't don't ignore what your skill guy is teaching you to do for sure unless it's blatant and then it's like i mean you can do this and continue to do this but that's why you're having some of these issues but you know a lot of the the skill guys that i work with you know we're on the same page as far as like how they should move mm -hmm. and, and but i don't ever want to cut in on you know i know your skill guys teaching you this but you shouldn't do this sure. you should do it my way 
I don't want to go and venture down that way. So ultimately it's helping someone avoid injury or recover from an injury and then creating that foundation for the player, the athlete as a whole to then build on, you know, for whatever sport Correct. they're, they're playing in. Correct. And then I think the thing that gets lost in this is that you can have an athlete that goes to a gym and they pay their money or they pay their time or whatever you want to call it. And you have them maybe for two hours out of the day. You have no idea what they're doing outside. Right. And you can only assume that what you're teaching them, they're adhering to when they go through their day-to-day -day life. But I mean, if a, kid, if a kid does everything he's supposed to do under your eye and then just trashes that when he leaves, you're the first that's gonna get blamed because you're the one that's either spending time with them, teaching them, or taking Keeping money them from them. Or, yeah, whatever. Yeah, and I mean, that, that goes kind of both ways. I mean, if they blow up, then you want the praise. Right. <laughs> if something happens, you don't want anything to do with it. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's, a, it's a bigger picture than just, oh, he trained for two hours, all these issues should be solved. Well, if the evaluation process is doing what it's supposed to do, and you bring to light some of those issues that, or the movement patterns that they have that are creating the problem, hopefully you're articulating that enough that it makes sense to them to not do what they're doing to create the problem. Right. And um, how often are athletes coming in to train? Is it every day? Is, are they on different schedules? It depends on the athlete, but I mean, yeah. you know, most of the middle school kids are three days a week, bleeding into the high school kids. If, if you find some of the more elite guys, they're in every day. Yeah. Definitely the college guys are, our pro guys are in mostly every day. I guess the one thing that is crazy to me in the industry is this unspoken ownership of an athlete that if they come into me that apparently I own them or they train with someone else, then, you know, you belong to them. And I would hope that I've never put that out to the athlete. I'm, I'm sure I have, but I would, I would hope that I never intentionally did that. However, I think that if you have certain athletes that spend X amount of time with you and especially if you've gifted them with comp training, meaning that they were in a financial situation, they yeah. couldn't afford it, uh, they spent a ton of time with you, you, you poured into them and then they just upped and left or they don't, you know, they don't give you, um, I guess your credence on, you know, social media, they don't mention you or they don't, they don't, um, they don't, they don't give any appreciation. Yeah. Then I could see where it's like, it really all that time we spent, you know, I give you, I gave you all this stuff and you wouldn't at least acknowledge this. Yeah. But as far as like the ownership of athletes, you know, I've had athletes leave different gyms to come to me. I've had athletes leave me to go to different gyms. And, you know, early on in my career, I took it personal just because I had my own issues that I was dealing with, that if an athlete left me, I, I took it personal, like you didn't want to be with me, you, I didn't matter. Um, you know, you, you process through those things and you realize that athletes don't just have one guy or girl or whatever you want to call it. They're going to go to this coach. They're going to go to that coach. They're going to go to check a box or fill a bucket that they have a need for, you know, you're not going to find Pat Mahomes doesn't have one guy he works with. I could be wrong, but I know the guy that he works with that moved to Kansas city. But I'm sure there's someone that he goes to for, you know, I've got this issue I'm dealing with. I'm going to go to this specialist. Right. Or I've got this issue. I'm going to go to this specialist. Or, you know, look, look at someone like um, Von Miller. Every city he goes in, he's got someone that he works with. Yeah. And I'm sure that when you see that from a bigger perspective, that one guy in Miami is not going to get mad at the guy in Colorado to get mad at the guy in Minneapolis to get mad at the guy in Buffalo. Right. If you do, eventually you run the risk of actually ostracizing that athlete or the athlete goes burning that bridge, burning that bridge, which I've done that. Um, I burned some bridges with some pretty heavy athletes that now looking back, I know why I did or not, not that I intentionally did, but I know why it went south. Right. Um, so, you know, you just got to learn and, and move on from there, but then also recognize why would the athlete go to someone different than you? Okay, well, if it's something that you don't have, get it or 
don't whine and complain when they actually leave to go find something else that you don't give them. It could also be a personality clashing too. It's like with my industry, it's like you're not going to jive with everybody. It's For sure. not going to work out. So, and, it, and you just, yeah, you can't take every, you know, everything personally and you can only can control what you can control and just do what you continue to do and, you know, whatever the results come. For sure. And that's, best. that was a hard, that was a hard pill for me to swallow early on in my career was that, um, client would come in, you know, you'd start to establish a rapport and you're like, okay, they, they, they choose me and then they dip out and they go somewhere else. And, and you're left with like, what just happened? And not knowing how to deal with my personal stuff back then, it was more of a, you know, I took it personal. I internalized it. What did I do wrong type thing when it largely it had nothing to do with me. It was that, well, I guess if it, if it was something I wasn't giving them in the training setting, then technically it was me, but I was taking, I was looking at it the wrong way. I have a question. So in this major league baseball draft that we just saw, there was a lot of talk about how high schoolers nowadays are more advanced physically with the ability that they have, um, all these different things, partially because pitchers are now throwing so hard in baseball. They also have better spin, these different things. Uh, do you see that you know, high schoolers may be more mature nowadays that are leading to better results for athletes? Or is that, or have they kind of been the same? Is that just a baseball specific thing? No, it's not baseball specific at all. It's, it's all across the board. So here's, here's my theory on all this. Um, I think when I started, you had trickles of information of how the pros were being trained. And then as you throw in like hard knocks and you throw in all these different channels, the NFL channel, YouTube, I mean, all of that, the MLB channel didn't exist in 2001. Right. Um, so you start to get glimpses of that type of training and then it trickles down to the college level and then trickles down to the high school level where you've got not necessarily the high school strength coaches doing it, but you have people like myself that were going, oh, they're doing ladders, they're doing bands, they're doing all this kind of stuff. And then you factor in, well, if little Timmy's doing it and he got this type of accolade or he got this scholarship or whatever, in today's day, you cannot get to where you want to go unless you have a trainer or you're with a club It just doesn't exist. The the three sport athlete that can just be really good at three sports and get recruited, I don't believe exists anymore. If he's just doing it organically. It's very specialized. It's like you pick one and go for that. Well, not necessarily that, but what I'm, what I'm getting at with that is that, you know, if you were to go in the Midwest, you could find a big farm boy that was maybe a three sporter that he just was good and he was big. Yeah that doesn't exist anymore. And I'm, I'm not saying that it doesn't completely across the board, but your three sporters now, they have a club that they play with. They probably have a, a specialized coach that they work with from a skill set. They have a trainer that they work with in the weight room where that's, that's trickled down now to where you're seeing, you know, primary kids, you know, kindergarten through sixth grade that are training, which is insane. Yeah. And also, um, I mean, part of the, you know, myth back in the day when I was growing up was you don't want to squat too early or you don't want to lift weights too early. Otherwise you're going to stunt your growth. Mm -hmm. And that's obviously just not true. Or, or does that have an effect? I, I'm still on the fence on that. I think if, well, I'll go, I'll go, I'll circle back to that. I think what's happened is the skill side of things has come down to the lowest levels to where these kids are really, really skilled at whatever sport and position they're playing but they're not skilled at moving. So if you look at kind of what that, um, you know, the scouting director was saying is that I think you find more and more kids that are starting the sport earlier, not in the sense that, well, we got them into T-ball earlier, but it's, it's completely changed in that it's not just play T-ball, have your tournament, have your game and go have fun. Now there's metrics to it. What is his exit velocity? What's his pitch? What is, you know, spin rate, like all this different stuff. I mean, who cares about spin rate? And I don't, I don't know necessarily that your spin rates are more today than they were 20, 30 years ago. No one measured it. Right. 
I mean, I guess you could break down video and you could probably, you know, derive it from that through AI and whatever. But do we really think that Nolan Ryan had a, a, a smaller... I was about to mention that, you know, they say that Nolan Ryan threw 108 miles an hour because they measured, you know, where they measure the velocity from back then different than they do today. Or that Bob Feller back in the 40s or something was throwing 107. It's like, you, you don't know. I mean, just the technology that is here today with everything yeah. is just so much more advanced than where it was in the past. And for sure. You can't quantify that accurately for what happened back then. No, and I, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there's technology that you could, you could pull from it and go, well, based on this. But I mean... I just find it hard to believe. <laughs> I mean, maybe you did. Yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, as much as we think there's this ridiculous advancement to athleticism, and there is an athlete's performances, there had to have been someone back in the day that was doing what they talk about. There's always outliers with everything. I mean, I've got to believe that there is. I can't, I can't think that 108 just happened, you know, 10 years ago. Maybe it did. I don't know. But, um, but back to the whole idea of the skill set coming down, you know, I think kids are throwing different pitches at younger ages than they ever did before where it was just fastball, fastball. And that's, I'm talking on a sport that I don't know a ton about, but I think it's across the board. You're seeing a higher skill set at a younger age, which then brings on the idea of, oh my gosh, you're so good. Well, if he's really good, what are we gonna do to get him to the next level? And I think it's created a, a, an aspect in the industry that's never gonna go away. So uh, I guess going from baseball to football, are you seeing the same thing in football? Same thing. Yeah. Okay. No, I wouldn't necessarily say that there's faster kids per se. Um, I think what's happening in, in sports in general is because the pressure has come down to the lower levels, at the same time, there's more access to the skill coaches. More of these kids are coming out at a younger age to get access to that that your, your bigger athletes, your more talented kids are coming more, I, I guess they're coming out of the woodwork is what I would say. Yeah. So you're seeing where at least in Vancouver 20 years ago, you had one, maybe two or three guys that were offered D1 scholarships. Now you're getting one or two per school. Really? It, oh my that gosh, it's, it's ridiculous. Wow. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think, I, I think the Oregonian had up how many guys had signed to play college and it's it's well into the hundreds of athletes just playing collegiate football where in clark county well i mean I'm, you're talking portland metro okay yeah yeah um clark county i believe last year there were i think it was around 65 to 70 kids that were playing collegiate football just football from vancouver wow that's that's insane. that's insane because if you look at 20 years ago you had i think you'd be lucky if it was 20 kids that were playing and there's, I don't see any signs of it slowing down. I mean, for football, I guess you could put in the CTE side of things, but. Are there less people playing football nowadays because of the recent stuff? I think it goes up and down. Yeah. I honestly, I don't know the uh, yeah, statistic yeah. on that. Um, I'm sure that it's, you're going to get a wave of kids that or a wave of generations or classes that go, it's not worth it. We're going to move on to something else. Go but play baseball you, instead of football. Well, kind of thing. but your your volleyball numbers are going up for male. Okay. Your rugby numbers are going up, but is it that they look and go, well, statistically, rugby is safer than football? I don't know. Are kids getting away from it because they feel like it's less violent? I don't know, but you can't deny all these numbers are going up in different facets and different sports. It doesn't it doesn't necessarily add up to me. Yeah. But maybe it is that. Well, back to it. Sorry, I digressed. I think you have waves of classes and years of kids that go, no, it's not worth it. We back off. But that next generation coming up with how seven on seven is turned, the funnel is always going to be full. And yeah. you, may, you may find that some of the high schools are struggling to field teams or kids just don't want to come out. Is that a CTE scare? Or is that just maybe your coach is just not – someone that can bring these kids out of the woodwork to train or to play, or maybe it's that you've just been in the cellar for so long that, you know, 
kids that come into that school think, why would I want to go out and get my butt handed to me every Friday? I'm not going to go and play. Yeah. And, and me personally, I, I played football until my senior year mm-hmm. and I just wasn't getting the playing time and I just didn't want to, yeah, I'd rather be in the stands watching them than, you know, sure. standing on the sideline in the rain. Well, then, then you throw in the political side of it. If you're not, there's that the too. And, and that's guys. part of it. I mean, I don't know, but it's like, <laughs> I know that's if, a... <laughs> if you're the best friend with the coach, yep. then you're obviously getting priority over someone else that yep. was grinding during practice. I don't know. You know, or it's, I mean, you know, if, if you've got a parent that has got a heavier checkbook Parents to the do. booster club and yeah, that's ridiculous that that actually plays a fact into it or factor into it. But I a hundred percent believe it, obviously. Oh, for sure. And, yeah. and, I think a lot of times if you find that that affluent family can afford the training, the extra this, the extra that, they kind of rise to the top. That doesn't mean they're the best player, but they check a lot of boxes in addition to maybe there's a check that's slidden into the booster club and there's nothing illegal about it. I'm not implying that. Right. But it's like if, if a family comes in and – you know, hey, we needed new jerseys this year. You want to keep them at your school if you're the school, you know? For sure. <laughs> um, but, I mean, there, you know, there's, there's that factor. Yeah. Because, I mean, there's, there's a ton of kids. I don't care what the school is. There's a ton of kids that work, work their butt off, that are never going to see the field. For sure. And maybe they're not that good. But yeah. if, if, we're, if we're evaluating things on effort, which a lot of coaches say that they do, that ain't necessarily how it comes out. Yeah. So are all of the athletes that you guys, that you guys train in person, or let's say someone's playing at college across the country or is in the NFL, Mm -hmm. are you guys still training from afar? We are. Yep. Okay. Yep. What does that look like? Just jumping on calls with them weekly? I mean, calls, lots of texts, you know, send video. Um, You know, it's just a matter of trying to keep the communication as... I don't want to say fluid, but as consistent as possible. Um, but that's where, you know, I don't know what they're doing unless they video. Yeah. Um, if they're professional, then I'm going to go, okay, it's a little bit less. I mean, it's your job. If you've hired me to do something or provide something for you, then I'm going to go on the assumption that you're doing it versus, you know, let's, let's FaceTime every day. You know, I guess we could, but I mean, I think that, that kind of gets a little overkill. Yeah. Um, but it, but it all depends. Every, every athlete's a little bit different. Every situation's different. Um, you know, I've got some guys, I, they've, they've been in it long enough. They've been in this system long enough that I don't need to see a video. I can just go, okay, here's the workout based on what they're telling me. I can, I can kind of know whether they're doing it or not. Yeah. Do you guys do diet also? Yep. Okay. Yeah. The nutritional side of things, I mean, that's, I think that's kind of evolved into its own monster in and of itself. Uh, we try to keep things as simple as possible. Um, just because the thing is, is that a lot of athletes are, there's always this rat race pressure to beat out the kid next to you or the guy next to you or what if this dude transfers in or what if our club brings in another guy that's in our position i mean that's that's inevitable if we're going to go to the next level anyways if you get recruited you may be good but if you're not producing they're going to bring in someone else that's going to do the job that they want you to do for sure so that so to the point on the nutritional side of things everyone's looking for a constant edge if it's sleep if it's you know i do this extra protein shake um, creatine, creatine. I mean, you name it, it's, it, it kind of gets overkill, but if you can teach the athlete how to manage those things, it creates less of a monster than what they could be struggling with. Yeah. So where do you see new athlete in the next five, 10 years? Well, uh, we just opened up, uh, another location in Hillsboro. Okay. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, if that does what Vancouver's doing, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be, in, we're going to be in good shape. Yeah. But as far as to answer your question in the next five to 10 years, um, I mean, I guess continuing to do the same thing, you know, trying to figure out where are our holes, where can we get better, um, where are we deficient and just trying to create the best product possible. Yeah. 
So you mentioned uh, uh, new athlete baseball is a separate thing. Mm -hmm. when, when did that section get started and what does that look like? So new athlete baseball is a separate entity that was started with uh, Tyler Dorn and Logan Ice. Um, Tyler's been with me for 15 years, both as a client and then started working for me. And Logan worked with us when he was with the Indians organization. Um, so they kind of presented the idea of doing new athlete baseball as a standalone. And I think a lot of that came to light just because the way that things were structured here kind of pinned Tyler down and he's a pitching specialist. Okay. And it wasn't allowing him to a breathe. I think he was getting burned out on just the way that things were structured then. Um, so he presented the idea of doing that and didn't want to leave New Athlete, but wanted his own thing, and that's where New Athlete Baseball came in. So he he helps specifically with pitchers? Uh, or just is he the whole baseball? It's also a, another guy you mentioned. Well, Logan Ice uh, is the hitting specialist, and okay. then Tyler would be the pitching specialist. Awesome. That'd be cool to connect with them at some point, too, and hear their stories and yeah, what, sure. what they do in that side of things because that'd be really interesting to hear there's a lot of commonalities as far as like the evaluation process uh in in their they're evolving also so i mean it's not it's not one thing where we go this is set this is how it is the other side of the evaluation process um we want to get a speed profile on the athletes to figure out are they quicker than they are faster are they faster than they are quicker and the data tells us exactly what they need. So you factor in the video analysis from the movement standpoint, then you throw in the data from the USR standpoint, and we feel like we have the best blueprint to give the athlete everything that they need, not necessarily what they want. But once we address the need, they get the want. Um, do you want to get into some of the athletes that you guys? Yeah, we can, guys? for sure. So are there any big names that you, you guys have? Um, I mean, there's always names. Um, I mean, recently right now, Caleb McGarry, uh, we're working with with the Falcons. Uh, he just signed a, a nice chunk of change. Uh, Ike Butker from the Bills, Dallin Levitt from the Packers. Um, last year, we had Marcel Harris from the Jets. Um, as far as volleyball is concerned, we've got Jasmine Gross. She plays in Switzerland. She was an All-American out of SC. Uh, Brianna Edwards, who just finished up a uh, Final Four appearance with San Diego. She's going to Italy to play. Um, Ashley Watkins played at Montana. Uh, I believe she was in Peru last year, and I, I think she's going to Germany. But, I mean, we've got the pro side of that. Um, I do work on pro baseball guys that New Athlete Baseball has from an injury recovery standpoint okay. with the ARP. Uh, we've got Jackson Cox. Um, he was a draft guy with uh, the Rockies last year, I think second round. Um, gosh, who else? We had Damon Stubbs. Um, are these all local people? Or yeah, these are all local guys. Wow. Yeah, okay. Alex McGarry, Wade Meckler, yeah. uh, both Oregon State guys. I think Wade might have gotten drafted this year, or uh, would have been. I, was he a, a hitter? He is a hitter. I think he's hitting. He's above 400. I mean, he's I, yeah. That's the guy that I was thinking of. I had seen him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Steady Eddie. Um, past guys, all the Wayland boys, Brady, Seaver, Caleb. Um, I mean, even going back into Tyson Van Winkle, Joel Staples. He's an old Skyview guy. Um, yeah, man, I mean, we've, we've, we've had a ton. I mean, what's crazy is up until last year, I had no idea the amount of athletes. And then to see that we've had 24 All-Americans now would be, I think we're up to 27. Um, you know, on the volleyball side, Lizzie Andrew is our most recent All-American. Uh, she's on the U.S. national team. Youth, uh, I, get, I get that confused sometimes, but she's a Stanford commit. Um, state champ with Ridgefield. Now she just won a national title with uh, her Man. club, Athena. Um, but I mean, it's it's pretty wild. I think we're over we're pushing over six to seven thousand athletes. Six to seven thousand athletes. Yeah, in twenty years, twenty plus years. Wow. And then, how many current athletes do you have on your books? Oh gosh, it's it's well, if you factor in. And you just uh, added Hillsboro, so that's a entire. 
new that's, market that that's you're another into. breed um but we train the entire athena club I and mean, it's 440 kids so I, if you're looking at like this calendar year it's probably going to be around it's going to be around 800 athletes man that's insane it's a grip yeah yeah it's crazy how many trainers do you have oh gosh one two three four five six seven 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 and then plus the other medical people and various and, people yeah then dan uh pt um then we've got some office people so i mean it's nine i awesome. think total so going from out of a trailer <laughs> yeah you know to this thing that you got going here that's pretty cool to see or for you to experience you know taking that leap and and that risk yeah and that's awesome that's really cool to see and hear, hear your story it's pretty wild um to see where things are to see where they came from um you know to see where it's going which i'm not really sure i mean yes and that sounds kind of silly that you know you've got two locations but you have no idea where you're going you, you just know, once one foot in front of the other it and is just keep and doing every day for sure and the the thing is is that you know i'm hit up by guys that are out of state that are like hey would you ever consider doing a facility in this state or that state yeah. and i'm like i guess i don't know i don't know what that looks like yeah i'm not opposed to it but you know what i what i would not want to do is franchise for the sake of doing that and then bastardize what we've created um or water it down or go okay here's my name you go ahead and do it and then you just start changing things up and we have no idea what you're doing or yeah. nothing was ever discussed so if it stays small then great it stays small but i'd rather have the product be the thing that speaks for itself for sure so you do, sp do you split time between here and hillsboro i do most of my times in vancouver okay awesome so if someone wants to reach you and become an athlete how did where can they find you uh newathlete.com or we're on instagram new athlete uh tiktok the new athlete twitter the new athlete and then we're on threads but i don't even know what my handle is i think it's new athlete okay awesome well yeah i appreciate your time really interesting to hear your story and um excited to see you know where things go for you in the future absolutely thanks for having me on i really appreciate it awesome